Talking Ohio State football, we got Steve Hellwagon on the line, a senior Big Ten writer there at Bucknuts 247 Sports. Steve, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Mark. What's going on? What is going on? You can't keep a quarterback on campus. That's what's going on. Yeah, that uh, kind of came out of left field not long after Ohio State wrapped up spring football. Within uh, three days uh, uh, last week, uh, uh, Matthew Baldwin came out with the idea that he was going to enter the transfer portal. And uh, Ohio State is currently finishing spring uh, semester classes, and I know this because I have twins who are in their second year at Ohio State, and we've been moving them piece by piece and little by little uh, back from campus. So I know that the exams are ongoing, and I assume that once Matthew Baldwin is done with the spring semester classes, he will uh, get into the decision phase and figure out uh, what his next step is going to be. And, and certainly I would assume the same thing applies for Ryan Day and his coaching staff and finding a graduate transfer uh, from the transfer portal that will, excuse me, come in and provide the kind of depth that Ohio State's going to need at the quarterback position. Uh, you know, there have been a few names that have been uh, thrown out there, but uh, I don't know. You know, it, it's happened so quickly that I don't think anybody uh, has a full idea yet of, of who's going to be interested or who Ohio State's going to be interested in uh, just yet. But, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting situation. I mean, Matthew Baldwin – uh, played uh, 30, had 36 throws in the spring game, threw for almost 250 yards and two touchdowns, and four days later wants to leave Ohio State. And, uh, you know, we don't really have the full rationale yet of why that uh, came about other than uh, it seems pretty obvious to everybody that Justin Fields, transfer from Georgia, will be the number one quarterback and uh, he got the preponderance of the reps during uh, the, the spring with the first team. So looks like uh, Matthew Baldwin uh, decided uh, that he wanted to, to try uh, his hand somewhere else, perhaps somewhere closer to his home in Austin, Texas. I mean, there's any number of Division I schools within the state of Texas alone, uh, probably 12 to 13 of them, that uh, he could fit in somewhere maybe a little bit closer to home as uh, – as a potential quarterback, but, uh, you know, hardly got to know ye or whatever that, uh, <laughs> whatever that phrase is. It, uh, it really is, uh, a tough situation for Ohio state. I mean, he redshirted last year coming off the knee injury and Ohio state helped him rehab his knee. And, uh, now that he's full go, uh, you know, is not going to be sticking around. It doesn't seem, uh, to, uh, to compete for that job. Get uh, Steve Hellwagon on the line from Bucknuts. Uh, join him right there for the best in Ohio State football coverage, talking about Matthew Baldwin moving on. And, of course, uh, with the Tate Martell transfer earlier, leaves the Buckeyes exposed to quarterback. Uh, you got to wonder that considering the spring game performance for Matthew Baldwin versus a 4-for-13 effort out of Justin Fields, and I think fans make too much out of the spring game and the performance there. Obviously there are scrimmages that are just as important to the coaches and they see the guys in practice every day. And we see the uh, glorified scrimmage at the spring game. And then, but, but had that narrative been playing out through much of the spring in regards to Baldwin playing that well, and maybe field struggling a bit that Baldwin was a bit frustrated by it not necessarily being a competition, just that Justin Fields has this pedigree, therefore he's got the job. Yeah, you make a very good uh, case. The days that we got to watch, it seemed like Fields got probably 80% of the reps with the first team and uh, Baldwin maybe 20%. So it didn't seem like it was a true 50-50 uh, or even 60-40 proposition where you could say that both guys were given uh, every opportunity. Um, you know, in their defense, I mean, Baldwin did get highlighted for lack of a better term in the spring game, but that's also now his platform to, to jump off and, and go maybe play somewhere else. So, uh, you know, I guess this is the day and age that we live in, um, you know, even, and, and I'm trying to choose my words wisely here, even people that you bend over backwards to try and help uh, with their situation, uh, you know, that loyalty is not necessarily going to be a two-way street. So, um, again, 
till I've walked a mile in his shoes. And I don't know what he went through in his first year at Ohio State. A long way from home, and it's entirely possible that there could be other factors in mind, but uh, he has left Ohio State in quite a lurch. There's no doubt about that. There's one uh, comment that comes to mind that Urban Meyer made uh, just following the enormous win two years ago against Penn State, 39-38, that great classic comeback win in which uh, Ryan Day rushed uh, into the film room or rushed into the coach's room, whatever the meeting circumstance was, to basically grab Urban Meyer and say, you got to see this kid, Matthew Baldwin, from Texas and, and watch him on tape. And Urban Meyer's like, we're, we're preparing for Penn State. This is important. And, and uh, Ryan Day was that adamant about his throwing ability and Urban Meyer needing to see him to get on it, to get him to Columbus, them being that impressed about uh, Matthew Baldwin's ability, regardless of him not being a primary like five or four star recruit or whatever the case might be. He wasn't uh, rated near the top of the rankings, but uh, Matthew Baldwin moves on and we will see where he lands and competes for a job. We got Steve Hellwagon on the line talking Ohio State football. So again, uh, you can support the channel by grabbing the Amazon link in the description section of any of the videos. You don't spend a penny, just uh uh, do your regular shopping and you support the channel right there. And the audio platforms were available on all the major platforms as well. People are asking about Garrett Wilson. That kid looked super smooth uh, in the spring game. And I guess from what I hear, that's just an extension of what everybody saw in practice that once he stepped on the field, he showed, yeah, I am truly a five star and ready to play. He's just that talented. Yeah, he may be. Uh, we think uh, the, the highest rated wide receiver that Ohio State has signed in, in quite a while. Uh, we were discussing it. Uh, Ted Ginn Jr. was the number two overall prospect in the country back in 2004, although he was mostly looked at as a cornerback, uh, although he didn't hardly even rep at cornerback before they moved him over to wide receiver in that uh, freshman year. And then the, the rest was history. Now he's a 13, 13 year. NFL veteran, but uh, Wilson has got some uncanny ability, and uh, he went up over a defensive back in the spring game, caught a touchdown pass, very impressive. Uh, ironically, it was from his high school teammate, Matthew Baldwin, who he will never, it seems, get to play in a regular season game uh, together, and, and uh, Wilson's probably uh, displeased by this whole uh, set of circumstances as well to lose a friendly face uh, and a guy who was here last year, uh, you know, one of his friends probably uh, to not be around. But Wilson, tremendous athlete, uh, great route runner, uh, great athletic ability for a, you'd say he's right around six foot, six one maybe and uh, has got incredible leaping ability, as we saw, to high point the football and make those plays. And, and so I think he's a guy that you're going to see quite a bit. It seems to me like the three starters at wide receiver will probably be the three seniors with Austin Mack, uh, K.J. Hill, and Benjamin Victor. But then you've got probably nearly as talented a group coming in off the bench with Chris Olave, uh, also uh, – uh, Garrett Wilson and, uh, you know, Jalen Harris, when he's healthy, he missed the last little part of spring. Uh, C.J. Saunders, the former walk-on, uh, he made a couple nice plays in the spring game as well. So uh, they are pretty deep at wide receiver, almost three deep at each position. And I think they're going to rotate a lot of guys and get a lot of people involved. And uh, again, I don't think you're going to see an offense that uh, is going to come close to the throwing numbers that we had uh, last year with Dwayne Haskins uh, throwing for just shy of 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. But it's still going to be impressive nonetheless uh, with Justin Fields now, uh, the unquestioned number one quarterback uh, going in uh, to the summer. And uh, obviously the biggest thing for the Buckeyes will be keeping him healthy at this point and uh, keeping him out there on the field. Talking Buckeyes, we've got uh, Steve Hellwagon on the line. You can join him at Bucknuts. That's uh, the 247 Sports platform for Ohio State athletics, Ohio State football coverage in particular. We've got the NBA fan uh, commenting on the live chat. Basically, he's wondering about the defensive scheme and that the bullet position seems to lend itself to, to one approach versus maybe the personnel not – 
uh, necessarily buying into or contradicting what would the bullet position would serve and maybe a 4-3 defense being better. I don't know if you've heard anything in regards to your your interviews in, in the spring on on what would be best for this defense. Well, I think that, again, they are looking uh, for ways uh, to uh, get the best 11 guys on the field in every situation. And, um, you know, I don't – I'm not going to get wrapped up in it. I think that uh, the defense – uh, whatever they do is going to be an improvement over what they had last year. Uh, you know, the big key is when you get into the big games, are they going to be able to hold the, the major opponents down and, uh, and create a winnable situation for the football team? And I, I don't have any doubt about that. I think that uh, the defense as a whole is going to be pretty strong. And as long as they, <clears throat> regardless of what they do in the back seven, as long as they've got the four me in front, you know, with the likes of Chase Young and Tyreek Smith, I went back and did a, uh, a research article looking at uh, Justin Fields and uh, his uh, play in the spring game. And the thing that kept hitting me between the eyes was how Tyreek Smith was living in the backfield. And I don't think that bodes real well for the guys who were playing on the offensive line, Nicholas Petit Ferrer and Josh Allaby uh, were kind of pressed into service with the first team on the offensive line. I think Brandon Bowen's going to be at tackle and the Rutgers transfer Jonah Jackson is going to be at guard when push comes to shove in the fall. Jackson hasn't even arrived on campus yet. So in my way of thinking, uh, you set the tone up front, uh, coming all the way around the bend with Tyreek Smith, uh, Robert Landers, Devon Hamilton. Uh, he made a couple nice plays in the spring game as well. Chase Young, outstanding defensive line that can get after opposing quarterbacks. And so I am uh, of a mind that they're going to set the tone for the defense. Malik Harrison can run. Uh, he uh, had a play where he tracked down Justin Fields running uh, sideline to sideline. He showed amazing speed, uh, I thought, as well throughout the spring. So he's going to play. They've got a three-man competition at uh, middle linebacker, Baron Browning, Tough Borland. Uh, those two guys are holdovers. And then Taraja Mitchell, who's a sophomore, uh, he's going to get a chance as well. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, between the front four and those two linebacker spots, uh, they got some pretty solid people who are going to play. And then that third linebacker spot, Pete Werner would be the starter right now, but that's the one that would come off the field for the bullets. So if they have a down and distance and game and time and yard line situation, where they think it behooves them to go to the fifth uh, defensive back, and it's this bullet, and it, it it's a guy who can uh, support the run and, and make plays sideline to sideline and help in coverage. I have no problem with this. I don't think the production was all that great from the linebacker group as a whole last year, so I'm not sure exactly what we're convention about. I mean, you know, Jeff Halfley and Greg Madison are experts. Jeff Athley coached in the National Football League. There's never been a situation that Greg Madison hasn't seen in his time as a coach. If they put their heads together and said, well, we've got uh, Brendan White and Sean Wade and Jeffrey Okuda and Jordan Fuller uh, and, uh, you know, all these other guys, uh, uh, Damon Arnett coming back as well. Um, those are five pretty good players. So if they have a situation where they're trying to get all five of those guys on the field, the fifth one of those guys may be better than the other linebacker they put out there. So, you know, again, this is not my forte. This is not my area of expertise designing winning defensive football. But if that's what they think is what's going to happen for them to contend, I mean, most of the teams they play run the spread at this point and some variation of it. And if they feel that this is the best way to attack the spread is uh, with this, then so be it. My guess is when they play Wisconsin, who lines up and tries to run over you, or Michigan State, which is more of a pro-style offense, well, yeah, maybe you'd stick with your 4-3, and it's the soundest way to uh, attack that offense. But most of the teams you're playing are spread teams with three wide receivers, one back set, one tight end, maybe two tight ends, whatever it may be. And to me, uh, this just makes perfect sense. I mean, you you got beat last year on plays in space. 
I mean, bigger than anything. Plays in space killed Ohio State last year. They weren't bombs. They were plays that started uh, as running plays or short passes that turned into long plays. And if they feel that, that this defense is what it's going to take to curtail those plays and make teams go station to station and get 10 yards and move the sticks and get 10 yards again and move the sticks, Ohio State, with the way they're going to move the ball offensively, they're going to win the battle field position all night long against whoever they play. If they just get a first down or two and then have to punt the football, they've pinned the opponent back. I mean, Drew Crisman was a, a tremendous weapon for Ohio State last year, punting the football, as was Johnston prior to him. And they've got a formula in place on how to play the overall game of football. It's it's honestly to play great offense at this point because you've recruited so well. You have talent across the board. Move the football. And, you know, the what is it? The best defense is a good offense maybe at some point. I don't know. But if you – and this came from Jim Trestle years ago. He said if we can pin the opponent back and they have to get six first downs to score a touchdown, that's awfully hard to do. So – Stop the big play, pin the other opponent back, and, uh, you know, make them have to go 70, 80 yards against the sound defense. That's a tough task in, in today's modern college football. Exactly. You're playing the probabilities there because you're forcing the offense to be perfect. And you may not make a defensive play to stop the drive, but they misfire a pass. They drop one. They have a penalty. A number of things can happen when you extend the drive and force them to go 85 yards instead of go 60 yards. And uh, that certainly plays into the hands of the defense and the probabilities of getting a stop. Again, not even just based on your defensive uh, prowess and being able to make a play on defense, but them just making a mistake and getting themselves behind the sticks. Uh, we got Steve Hellwagon on the line. Uh, Steve, I believe you certainly addressed uh, what was going to be my next question, courtesy of the live chat concerning the linebackers and people's concern about the linebackers. And you certainly addressed that again with uh, some struggles in space against the likes of uh, a lot of the teams that we mentioned outside of, yes, i.e. Wisconsin, in particular Michigan State, uh, the Oklahoma game from two years ago, even though that defensive performance start to finish uh, both against Oklahoma, who only had nine points on the board going into the fourth quarter, and for the entire season was much better when they had issues. It was covering those uh, backs in space and the tight end and so forth at the linebacker position. But Ohio State uh, believes they're better fortified and from a scheme standpoint, better prepared to give these kids a simplistic defense that they can just run and hit and use their athleticism to get the job done. Uh, Steve, Michigan and I believe this comes from head coaching stability and from quarterback stability with Shea Patterson and Jim Harbaugh has been installed by most as not just a Big Ten favorite, but like an overwhelming favorite. When you consider that the college football playoff predictor states that Michigan has a 41% chance of making the playoff and Ohio State has a 6% chance. Now that seems ridiculous to me. A seven times better chance than Ohio State of getting to the playoffs? Yeah, I'm not quite sure uh, what the data is that they've put into the uh, the formula because Ohio State's going to have nine guys back on defense. It's going to be much improved on defense. And, <clears throat> I mean, perhaps they looked at what Justin Fields did in the spring game and were not impressed by that, which is easy to understand because he was 4 of 13, as we talked about. But, I am not of a mind to downrate Ohio State uh, on the basis of what he did in the spring game. I think the, the, the idea coming out of the spring was that on the whole he was pretty good. Um, I honestly don't know what to say about that because uh, Michigan, uh, when you think about it from even a, a five miles up in the air point of view, uh, they have to play Notre Dame. Now it's at home, and they also get Ohio State at home, which is a tremendous benefit for them to win bump one or both of those games would be huge. Uh, but their uh, non-conference uh, by playing Notre Dame is much tougher than Ohio State. Ohio State has to play Florida Atlantic, uh, Cincinnati, and the third one, I'm, I'm drawing a, a blank on it. Miami of Ohio, I believe. Yeah, Miami of Ohio, which was – 
like a 500 team in the MAC last year. So, uh, I mean, Cincinnati was a 10 win team last year, beat Virginia Tech in their bowl game, I believe. And um, they're going to come to Columbus and give Ohio State a test. But I think Notre Dame goes into Michigan and gives them a much tougher game uh, than anything Ohio State's going to face. And then their, I presume their Big Ten schedules are pretty comparable. They play each other. So the better team between the two of them uh, is going to probably represent the Eastern Division. Um, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, I could be flippant and I can point out that, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, and I don't, I've never done any research, but I can almost say to a, without even looking, that there hasn't been a college in America, other than maybe Notre Dame, that has started at one place in the preseason poll and ended up well below where they started in the preseason poll in the postseason poll than the University of Michigan. And I mean, they are perennially top 10, seven, eight, nine, 10 every year, and they never finish top 10. And I mean, maybe one top 10 in the last 15 years, maybe. So I guess, mm-hmm. I guess you're gonna have to show me. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to, you know, tell me and show me. Um, and I'm not, I'm gonna readily state Shea Patterson, you know, they, they could have a pretty good team, but I just, I mean, you lose the guys that they lost. I mean, Bush, you know, Winovich, uh, you know, Gary. The guy front, yeah, all those guys on defense, you lose the guys that they lost, and you're telling me they're going to be just as good or better? And even with those guys, they came into Columbus with this number two, number three, number one ranked defense that gave up 62 points. So, you know, they may be driven to finally. Uh, get the Ohio State monkey off their back, and the game is in Arbor. But you're going to have to show me before uh, I can buy into that entirely. So I don't know. And I'm not. I'm not trying to play the partisan card or anything else, other than to say, you know, that's cute. I suppose that's a, you know maybe this is going to be their year. Every dog has their day, I guess, and uh, maybe this will be it for them. But um, again, you're just going to have to prove it to me. You're going to have to show it to me because uh, I haven't seen anything over the last 10 years to indicate that, uh, I mean, they haven't recruited at the same level Ohio State's recruited. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm, I'm at a loss. Um <laughs> There's a stat kind of segueing into the draft that in the uh, playoff era of the last four years, Ohio State's had 31 guys drafted, and the next two best teams in the Big Ten uh, had 19 and 12. So Ohio State alone had as many as the next two teams in the Big Ten combined drafted in the last four or five years. And there's nothing to indicate that, that the talent has dropped off at Ohio State. They they didn't have a pair of classes that were ranked in the 20s. Every class they've signed has been in the top five or six. Now they have to go out on the field and prove it. They have to go out on the field and, and play championship football. But even with the substandard defense last year, of course you caught a once-in-a-lifetime quarterback performance from Dwayne Haskins. You won 13 games, won the Big Ten, and 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 won the Rose Bowl. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm – <laughs> I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be that troll or be that guy. I'm just pointing out that they're not as Ohio State's defense is nowhere near as bad as maybe they were. They'll be nowhere near as bad as they were last year. They're going to be much. Think so. They've got too much talent. Yeah, I, uh, I've gone off on a tangent here. It, it's it's. Well, I love it. It's a long season. It's a long season, and anything can happen. If Fields gets hurt, they're eight and four. I mean, there's just no question about it. I mean, I mean, who are you going to put in there? You've got Chris Chuganov, who uh, was Will Greer's backup at West Virginia when he got hurt a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't think they won any of the games he started at West Virginia uh, when he got in there. So it really is a harrowing situation right now, unless and until they can find somebody who can help stabilize that quarterback 
situation. Well, can you just imagine if what just happened with Matthew Baldwin and Tate Martell leaving would have happened in 2014, there would have not been a JT Barrett or Cardell Jones backing up a Braxton Miller when he got hurt to save the season and win a national championship. That would have been fascinating. We would have never known what would have happened, but they would have not went 14 and one and won a national championship. You also give me uh, the last thing I'll say here, Steve, before we move on to Miami talk is that uh, your comment about the NFL draft and having as many NFL draft selections from Ohio state as the next two teams in the big 10 over the course of however many years, uh, the last few years is the quality of those selections is also not even, it's not even close. Yeah. If yeah. we would also measure not just the quantity, but the quality of selections, first rounders, high seconds, et cetera. You've given me two great video topics here. Uh, rankings difference. Who is ranked where in the preseason poll over the last 10 years versus where have they finished and what schools have had the biggest disparity? And I think you gave me two good schools to start with in Notre Dame and Michigan. And then the other one, yeah. NFL draft selections. Yeah, I think in the last 10 years, USC has probably be up there since Pete Carroll left. It's been yeah. perennially top 10 every year and, and not even ranked probably at the end of most of these years. And then, uh, I mean, I'm just calling it the way I see it. I mean, it, you know, Notre Dame, uh, you know, obviously made the playoff uh, this past year. Don't recall where they were in the preseason, although I know that there was a lot of hype uh, for their game uh, with Michigan early in the season. Um, just to hit the draft real quick, I know it's uh, coming up uh, tomorrow. Uh, fully expect Bosa to go in the top two picks. Uh, Haskins, to my way of thinking, would be great to go to the New York Giants at number six. But the Bengals or the uh, Miami Dolphins would also be uh, good spots for him to land. And, uh, you know, there. here's a statistic. All time, uh, USC has 81 first-round picks. Ohio State has 79. Mel Kuyper does not have anybody from USC projected in the first round. In one of his projections, he snuck either Campbell or McLaurin into the first round. So if they get Bosa, they get Haskins, and either Campbell or McLaurin or Draymond Jones, who it only takes one team to like one of those three guys late in the first round, and USC gets shut out in the first round, Ohio State takes the all-time lead, or they're worse going to tie it if USC doesn't get one because Bosa and Haskins are guaranteed first round picks. Uh, they're at least going to tie it. If they get a third one and USC goes over, Ohio State takes the all time lead. And one more stat to throw out there. Haskins will be the first big 10 quarterback to go in the first round since Kerry Collins from Penn state in 1996. I know it's crazy. And, and the funny thing is, I can remember where I was. My cousin, I think she got married that day in Yorksville, Ohio. And I was at her wedding reception, and we were watching the draft in the bar at the wedding reception. I remember this because Ricky Dudley, who was a tight end from Ohio State, went in the top 10 or 15 picks of the NFL draft. And no one had been – he went ahead of Eddie George. Tampa Bay. I yeah. I mean, it was crazy. But – at any rate, uh, Kerry Collins, last Big Ten quarterback, taking the first round, although Drew Brees and, uh, of course, the guy at New England, you know, have had amazing oh NFL point. careers. And, and Russell Wilson technically is a Big Ten guy from Wisconsin. But, yeah, there uh, may be three Hall of Famers right there from the Big Ten that didn't yeah. get into the first round. Uh, That's our draft talk. Those are our storylines going in tomorrow on the draft. Oh, it's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts. Join him right there at 247 Sports, uh, the best in Ohio State football coverage. Steve, we appreciate you stopping by. We'll be uh, locked in for the draft, and hopefully we can catch up with you next week. All right, Mark. Take care.